that you're here in Kingston tonight. I want to open up with prayer, so let us uh, bow our heads together and ask God for his help tonight. Amen. Lord, again, we thank you for your blessings to us. You've given us so many things. We thank you for this day, this time to celebrate what you are doing in, in hearts and lives for yes. the kingdom of God. And we ask, Lord, that in this service you would receive glory and honor and praise. For the things that are accomplished for your kingdom, lift our hearts. Heaven, Lord, word, Lord, may we look as well into things for eternity's view. We're praying that you would receive glory and honor and praise for what is done. We ask these things in thy precious name. Amen. Amen. Well, it's um, my privilege to um, welcome the convention group here. Paul and his wife Nancy Gray, Brother Parker, uh, John Parker, and then the Dewhurst that are here too as well, helping us with singing, and his wife's on the Praise panel. The Lord. We're glad they're here, that God would just bless and help our convention together. Let's sing to the Lord too as well, as they worship uh, with us and, and leading us in, in the worship. Thank the Lord. Amen. Thank you, brother. It is no secret. What God can do to see revival. We've had maybe here and there a little taste of it, but oh, wouldn't you like for God to rend the heavens and come down? Sometimes he looks our direction. And I've been in those kind of services, but I want to see God literally come down and bless our hearts together. Some, some of you have been waiting for a long time. I think this is uh, about the fourth year without an IH convention. Maybe it's been four years since you've had a revival, I don't know. But you know what? God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God wants to help us. Yeah. Amen. And my heart says yes to him. Thank the Lord. Well, let's sing that chorus one more time. It is no secret. Thank you. 
don't you? Psalm number 423. I have found His grace in all
talk about a Savior that can be there for whoever, but I'm glad he's a wonderful Savior to me. Praise Amen. God. What a blessing it is. And thank you, Chris and Constance Stewart. We love their singing and playing, and I appreciate so much them being here for this convention. And uh, I'm glad I'm included and uh, appreciate so much for the privilege of being here. We're going to have a good time. I believe the Lord's going to help us. We're going to stand for prayer tonight and uh, going to ask Brother Joseph Crone, if he would, to lead us in prayer. And uh, we ask that he will, as he leads us, let's all pray together. Asking God for revival. He's not limited. We can have it in just a few services. Amen. Let's keep our hearts open. <coughs> Lead us, please. Our fathers, we come before you tonight and thank you for the privilege of prayer and, and for special services and for the ministry of IHC mm -hmm. and for the local churches. And Father, we thank you again for your presence that meets with us and for the nearness of your, of your spirit as you lead and guide us each and every day. We thank you for the songs of praise and worship that we sung together tonight. We thank yes. you that we can rejoice in you as our wonderful Savior, as our mm -hmm. good and beautiful Father today, yes. that we can rejoice yes. in your, your, you. your, 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 your grace to us, your mercy, your steadfast yes. love to us. And we thank you that we can rejoice together in you today. Father, we pray, Lord, that, that you would be with uh, our, our country, be with uh, our, our country tonight, and the need for revival across our land, Lord, that you would that you would that you would uh, uh, encourage our hearts tonight and lift us upward as we praise you and worship you together tonight. And Father, that you would use us and speak to us and guide us yes. and share your love to the world Thank around you, us. And Father, we pray that you would uh, uh, bless the ministry of our receiver, uh, the Israel trip coming up soon, and that you give protection and traveling mercies and for each one that travels and Father, we pray for the service tonight, and that you be with uh, Brother Carper as he preaches, that you give them a, a special touch, help us to, to be good listeners, mm -hmm. hearers, and responders to what you have for us tonight. And Father, we yes. pray to be the special music in each part of this service today as we continue yes. to delight in you and to worship you. Oh, we thank you again God. that you do all things well. Mm -hmm. Father, we pray for needs tonight, perhaps uh, unspoken needs, burdens that you place on our hearts, and we thank you that we can trust yes, in you to, to meet our needs according to your mm -hmm. timetable and your plan for our lives. And, Father, again, we pray your blessing on the service tonight, and we thank you for your love for us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.
so glad when uh, Brother Cassidy said your co-worker is going to be John Parker. Thank you, Brother Greg. I'm going to invite you first to the Gospel of John, chapter 16. This is a holiness convention. Yeah. And so I want to start out tonight by talking about the role of the Holy Spirit. I have come to a new and deeper, fresh, deeper appreciation of the beautiful asset of the Holy Spirit's role in my own personal life, but also in the life of believers. As Brother Gray said, I, my responsibility these days is the care of churches in six southern and southeastern states, basically west or east of the Mississippi. And um, so I'm caring for 31 churches in those six states. And as I travel, as I minister in those churches, I just find we need the Holy Spirit. Yes, yes. We need an active Holy Spirit in our midst. Yes. At the same time, I, I'm reading through the Bible chronologically with uh, Dr. Nathan Brown's uh, Come After Me. I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with that. I know Joe and Carissa would be. Um, Nathan's our Bible Methodist discipleship coordinator. But he has a website on which he's developed materials for helping Christian families, holiness families, disciple their own families and children. If you're not familiar with it, look it up, comeaftermed.com. And on that, there's a Bible tab, and he does a chronological reading through the entire Bible. So you're getting the picture of the Bible as it happened, not yes. just as it's put together in the scriptures. And as I've been reading through that, one of the things that I have just been bothered by, I guess is the easiest way to say it, is just how bumbling and stupid sometimes Old Testament followers of God were. I mean, just made some horrible messes in their life. And I'm thinking, that was dumb. You know, I've done some things like that myself, but um, wow. And just troubled by it. And as I was praying and meditating about it one morning, Chris, it, it just seemed like this, the Lord said, you know, they didn't have the personal Holy Spirit guiding them, as we're going to read in, in just a few moments here in John 16, ordering their lives. And I said, Lord, thank you for the presence of the Holy Spirit that keeps me straight, yes. keeps me on track, that enables me to serve you. I, I don't have the wisdom. I, I'd be doing what some of those Old Testament characters had done without the presence and, and role of the Holy Spirit in my life. So that's why I believe this is so very vitally important to us that we understand and, and appreciate that God wants an active role in your life. And in our dispensation, in our time, that is through the Holy Spirit. And we're going to read from Christ himself here. It's interesting, this chapter starts with this phrase, These things have I spoken unto you, verse 1. And it ends in verse 33 with, These things have I spoken unto you, that. And we'll go to that later. But Jesus says, I'm speaking these things to you, that you should not be offended. Now, the word offended to us means to get your feelings hurt. That's not the word at all in the original language here. This word means caused to stumble. So Jesus is saying, I don't want you to mess up. I don't want you to be caused to stumble. And Brother Joe, that's why I'm thinking in the, in the lives of those Old Testament characters. Wow, if they had just had the Holy Spirit, they wouldn't have messed up like they did. And you know, I thank God for the Holy Spirit that keeps me out of message. Amen. And Jesus is saying, fellas, if you listen to me, you don't have to blow it. You don't have to mess up. Listen, they shall put you out of the synagogue. Well, that's not good news. There's bad news coming. You're going to have a rough road. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service. Does that sound familiar to anybody here? One of the largest religions in the world tonight teaches as one of the tenets of its faith that to kill Christians is to do God's service in the name of Allah. 
And these things will they do unto you because they have not known the Father, nor me. But these things have I told you, that when the time should come, you may remember that I told you of them. And these things I said not unto you at the beginning, because I was with you. But now I go my way to him that sent me, and none of you asketh me, Whither goest thou? But because I have said these things, and you sorrow hath filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. I don't know how you feel about it, folks, but I'm thankful for a God that tells me the truth. Yes, he does. I'm thankful for a pastor that tells me the truth. Amen? Amen. If you have a pastor that tells you the truth, whether you really want to hear it or not, Jesus said, I know you guys don't want to hear this, but I'm going to tell you the truth anyway. Mm -hmm. You better thank God for a pastor. Yes. Yeah. For, for a spiritual leader mm -hmm. that will tell you the truth, even if you don't want to hear it. I said this, nonetheless, I tell you the truth. It is for your good, it is expedient for you that I go away. Mm -hmm. For if I go not away, the Comforter, and that's capital C, speaking of the Holy Spirit, will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin because they believe not only of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. That's another aspect of our Lord that I have deep appreciation for. The Lord knows what you can bear. And he's not going to put more on you. Right. I also thank God for pastors that are sensitive to what people can bear. Amen? Yeah. And, and will not overload you. The preacher may overload you, but God will never overload you. Amen. And he will be patient with you where you are in your spiritual yeah. maturity and growth. He's not going to put more on you than you can handle. Yeah. And, and Jesus is clear in saying that. And uh, he, he has been that way in my own life. So... He says, uh, let, me, let me find myself again. When he has come, let me back up to verse 8. When he has come, he will reprove the world of sin, of righteousness, of judgment, because, of sin because they believe not only of righteousness, because I go to my Father, you see me no more. Of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. I have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. How be it? When he, the spirit of truth, is come, again, Speaking simply of the Holy Spirit, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I, that he shall take of mine, and shall show it unto you. A little while... And you shall see me no more. And yet a little while. And you shall see me because I go to the Father. I want to take you to one more statement. One little short verse that is found in the Apostle Paul's writing to the Thessalonian church. One of the clearest messages in the entire scriptures. Of support for what we believe as Wesleyan Arminians in second blessing holiness. Or in entire sanctification. You can follow this, this little book and, and you just find it laid out clearly for you. But in the concluding verses, the concluding verses of First Thessalonians, Paul is wrapping it up. And in these latter verses, he gives some short little bursts of admonition, beginning of verse 16, rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, in everything you think, this is the will of God in Christ concerning you. And it's verse 19 I want to call your attention to as my focus for this evening, quench not the spirit. Good, good. So Jesus is talking to his disciples and to us in chapter 16 of John's gospel, where our focus is tonight, about the role of the Holy Spirit. Yes. And he says to them, here's what he will do when he's come. And it's better for you that I go away so the Holy Spirit can come. And Paul simply says to believers, don't quench. The Spirit. Now, I'm interested in what Paul means by that and looking it up the word, doing a little bit of word study 
To us, the word quench means what you quench thirst, so you, you take a, a drink of water, which means to, to get rid of it. Or, but this word is the word, the word which means, it's the, the Greek word spinrume, and it means to extinguish as you might smother a fire. Well, as I look at that and studied a bit, I have a brother-in-law who is a fire chief and obsessed with firefighting, as a good fireman often is. And, and uh, I talked to him a little bit about smothering fires, extinguishing fires, as his pastor for a good number of years. He one day said, hey, you interested in watching going for a practice burn with the fire department? I said, absolutely. So he gave me the address. I showed up. It was a big old farmhouse, wood frame farmhouse, mm -hmm. that they were going to burn. Mm -hmm. And they had fire departments from a multiple areas there that, that had come. They had some, some firefighting equipment companies that were there to talk about their equipment. And, uh, man, they had, they had donuts and coffee and biscuits. It was like a party, you know. Uh -huh. And uh, the firemen were pretty excited about it. I thought they were a little overexcited to be firemen about burning a house. You know? <laughs> but finally the time came and the uh, selected firemen that were going to be the first to go in to fight this fire were all geared up, ready to go. And the house was set on fire. And I mean, they put a lot of, 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 of flammable liquid inside that thing. And boy, all of a sudden there was a roaring fire inside that big a wood frame farmhouse so much that the windows blew out uh, with the with the fire and the, 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 the heat and those old guys man they grabbed their hoses and they went right in the front door of that house and right into that fire and I'm telling you folks in a matter of seconds that roaring fire that had blown out the windows of that house was completely out wow I said, what in the world did they do? And my brother-in-law said, he was more than happy to explain it to me. He said, we have a new technology we're trying here today. He said, you know, people think we just pour water on fire and, and drown it, you know, with enough water. But he said, this technology literally creates a vapor bubble with a fine mist that encapsulates the fire, if you can get the fire in one area, and that's why they put it out so quickly, it was in, contained in one area of the house. It encapsulates that fire in that vapor bubble, and fire can't burn if it doesn't have oxygen. It's like putting a snuffer over a candle. It robs it of its oxygen, and the flame goes out very quickly. Boy, the Holy Spirit took that to my heart in the context of this admonition of Paul. Don't quench the Spirit. The word is don't extinguish the fire of the Holy Spirit by not allowing the Spirit to have the conditions conducive to Him functioning in your life. Don't smother the Spirit. Right, right. I began to think about that as a pastor. And I thought, I've got folks in my church that are robbing the Holy Spirit of the conditions necessary for the Spirit to function in their lives. Some of them are doing it intentionally. And they're not usually there, sitting on the pews of the church to hear the preacher preach or to go through a sermon. They're surely not going to be in an IH convention. There are people that would just not be here because they don't want to dare expose their hearts, their minds, their lives to the truth, yeah. to the Word, or to the Holy Spirit. They're quenching the Spirit very intentionally. But folks, I'm probably less concerned about those that are doing it intentionally than I am about those who are doing it unintentionally. Mm -hmm. What do you mean, preacher? I mean by just getting so busy and so tired and so distracted, distracted driving is not the only thing that's dangerous to you, friend. It is. It blows my mind as I travel up down the highways in the U.S. at how many people are on a cell phone. And most of our states now have laws uh, against it. But it's still happening. It's still happening. That's dangerous. And there are a lot of terrible wrecks that happen as a result of it. But right. folks, 
I'm talking about the distracted, distracted living. So that the Holy Spirit never has an opportunity to talk to your heart. You're smothering the Spirit. You're yeah. robbing Him of the conditions necessary for Him to function in your life. Mm -hmm. Whatever the case, my friends, whether it's intentional or unintentional, it's a serious mistake, a tragic mistake, and it has eternal consequences. Jesus gives us three very distinct and powerful ways the Holy Spirit functions in our life in these verses. First, I want to take you to verse 8. And I hope you have your Bible there and you're open tonight to John 16. John's Gospel, chapter 16, and verse 8. And when He, the Holy Spirit, is come, He will reprove the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Quench not the Spirit's reproof. In your life. Now folks, it's one thing for us to talk about holiness and, and sanctification and a lot. But let me just boil it down to a very simple matter. Folks, if you will allow the Holy Spirit to function in your life, the Holy Spirit is going to reprove you when sin gets close. That's it. And guide you into truth. Yeah. And we won't have to preach it nearly, hot, nearly as hot and heavy to get you to be obedient and to walk in the light if the Holy Spirit is working in your life. The first area, there's three areas here that he says the Spirit reproved. First of sin. Are you thankful for the Holy Spirit's faithful reproval of sin? I am, folks. I am. The more I function in, in the capacity that I'm in as a conference president, working and responsible for pastors and churches, the more I understand the absolute necessity of the Holy Spirit's constant reproof of sin in our lives. Brother Gray and I were talking coming up the road yesterday with the heavy hearts of uh, recent situations that have arisen of promising young pastors and promising people who have fallen into sin Somewhere along the line, they stopped hearing the Spirit's reproof of sin. Who is it, my friends, you are depending on for your reproof of sin? I hope it's not your mother and your dad. I hope it's not your pastor. I hope it's not your husband or your wife. I hope it's the Holy Spirit. For mom and daddy can't always be there and pastor doesn't always know and your wife and, or your husband doesn't always know yep. but the Holy Spirit is 24-7 on the job. You can't get away from him. That's why Jesus said in this passage, you know, uh, some of you are sorrowful for, because I'm going away but I'm telling you, it's going to be better that the Holy Spirit comes because Jesus in a physical body could only be one place at one time. But the Holy Spirit is everywhere present at all times. Isn't that amazing? So how can I quench the Spirit's reproof of my sin? Simply by accepting any other authority. Any other arbitrator. Or referee. To call the balls and strikes. In your life. Hmm? Who's calling the ball from the stars? Who's calling the fouls in your own? My peers. Oh, that's dangerous. If you accept any other arbitrator of sin, you're in trouble. You're in trouble. And I would even say, don't even trust your own conscience because your conscience can be seared. It can be affected and influenced. By, by arguments and position. Dr. Dewhurst can tell you more about that. But don't even trust your own conscience. Paul writes about people who the God of this world has blinded the eyes of, of them, warped their values, and hardened their hearts to sin. Thank God for a tender conscience and yes. a faithful Holy Spirit that will yes. reprove you. He that being oft reproved hardeneth his neck shall suddenly be destroyed in that without remedy. Don't quench the Spirit's reproof. My friend, thank God when He reproves Amen. you. Amen? 
If you're about to click on a link on a, on a website and the Holy Spirit says, don't go there, and you don't go there, you ought to just stop right there and say, thank you, God, right. for protecting me. There's a second area that he talks about, he reproves us, and that is of righteous. Not, not only the negative side, but the positive side. Oh, my friends, we need this desperately. So what is right? What is right? What is wrong? Well, we're living in a world these days that uh, that's been turned upside down, hasn't it? <clears throat> People call good evil and evil good and, mm -hmm. and sin okay. And, and uh, it, it's, it's a perverted world. The, the faithfulness of the Spirit will reprove you of righteousness. He will hold up the standard of righteousness in your life. And Paul said it like this in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 13. Until we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect or complete man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That's it. You know, folks, it's not a matter of picking out the godliest person in the church and just trying to model your life after them. That's not enough. No. It's not enough to try to be like your dad or try to be like your mom, even if they are good people. And I've aspired to do that myself in my life, to be like my dad, to be a godly man like my dad. But friends, that's not enough. No. We must have the Holy Spirit reproving us of yes. Yes. righteousness. You know, when people, when people assume that role in our lives, uh, it'll leave us in, in, in a difficult place. I've watched it. I'm old enough now. I'll be 67 this summer. I'm old enough to have watched generations pass. And some of those previous older generations were very strong and very vocal and very, very demanding. And they managed to keep control and they managed to, to kind of keep everybody in reign, in line. And then they pass off the scene. And all of a sudden, nobody knows how to make a personal decision. For no. What's wrong with that picture, friends? What is wrong with that picture? The thing that is wrong is, mom and daddy should have never been the one setting the standard for what was right in their children's life. That's the role of the Holy Spirit. And mark me, if you're just depending on a, a previous generation or an older generation to keep you in line, there's coming a day and they'll be gone. Yeah. I watched it with pastors and strong pastors pass off the scene and all of a sudden, a whole church takes a turn and goes a different direction <coughs> because it's not the Holy Spirit. No. That is... Reproving of righteousness. Interesting. I, uh, I'm in Alabama now. I started my pastoral ministry in Alabama. We planted a brand new church in a very southern, the very most southern county of the state of Alabama, right down near the Florida Panhandle. And and and, and they're real, real rednecks. That, they're real genuine southerners. And. Uh, I worked with the roughest of, of the crowd. Uh, people that had never been in church had no, no connection to church. And we got them in, and thank God, one of them was the pastor until he just passed away this past year from being converted through that ministry. And another one uh, moved his family later to North Carolina, started a new church, and has two sons that are pastors, he and his sons in ministry. But they were rough. And more than one time on a Saturday afternoon out visiting trying to get people in church, I'd walk up on the front porch in about every house in South Alabama has a front porch. And it'd sound like World War III inside the house. Mm -hmm. Television blaring, people screaming. Uh, it sounded like it wasn't a happy place inside the house. Mm -hmm. And knock on the door, and it'd be so noisy in the house they couldn't even hear you. So get my pocket knife out or something and bang on the door enough where they could hear. And this is the way it would happen. You would see the Venetian blinds in the window of the door and part about that much and little eyeballs sticking in that crack <laughs> in the Venetian blind. And then you'd hear this, it's the preacher, it's the preacher. <laughs> 
All of a sudden, World War III was yeah. called to a screeching halt. <laughs> the TV was turned off, and Mark furniture was scraping around in the room. I don't know what, I, bottles and who knows what were being hidden. And, and it'd take them a little while to get everything straightened up, and then somebody come to the door, open the door. Why, preacher? <laughs> it's like they had no idea. <laughs> and you go in and visit. What I, I often don't know what makes people do that. Mm. Huh? It's just a preacher. I crawled up in the truck with an old boy that had been a pulp order, and a load of logs had come off of his truck on top of him several years before and torn one of his legs off below the knee. And he had a terrible fitting prosthesis on that leg. That, it just flopped around. <laughs> Somehow he managed to get point A to point B like that. And he'd been a drunk and God had beautifully saved him, changed his heart and life. And he wanted to take me fishing. I called up in the cab of his old beat up truck that had been full of beer cans in the back, but those were all gone. And we tore off down the road at a breakneck speed to go fishing together. And all of a sudden, he, he said, Preacher, I'm sorry, I gotta stop. He slid off the road into a gravel parking lot of a little country store in a cloud of dust and piled out of that truck. And I thought maybe he was sick, you know, and he tore off around behind the station, a little gas station, country store. And in a minute or two, he came back and got in the truck while he smelled like he'd been on fire. <laughs> I knew exactly why he stopped then, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, he smelled just like a cigarette. Mm -hmm. And backed out and down the road we went in a cloud of dust. And I said, God, wh why did you stop? Oh, preacher, I, I said, did you stop to smoke? Mm -hmm. And he said, well, yeah, I did, preacher, yeah, I did. I, I ain't gonna smoke with you in the truck with me. I just ain't gonna do it, ain't gonna do it. And I said, God, I am just sure as I can be that I heard you give a testimony in church the other night and said it's so good to have Jesus in your heart. That's, that's right, he said. That's right. That's what you took Jesus around behind the building to smoke. Mm. I thought you were going to wreck the truck. <laughs> it tore him up so bad. He said, I ain't even thinking about that. And I said, if you'll smoke in front of Jesus, you might as well smoke in front of me. Mm. Right? Mm -hmm. That's right? And folks, that's true whether. You're looking at something on the internet, mm -hmm, sir. or watching a video, mm -hmm, sir. or listening to music. Sir. Yeah, it really doesn't matter what it is. Mm -hmm. You got Jesus looking through your eyes if you belong to Him, yeah. and the Holy Spirit will be faithful to say to you, "Ah, uh -uh, we don't do this. Uh -uh. No, we don't do this. We don't watch this. Mm -hmm. We don't click on that." He will reprove of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. And I've got to hurry. Y'all not saying enough, amen. <laughs> judgment. He's going to remind you, faithful, of the coming year. You're not going to live your life like there's no tomorrow. You know, I don't, I don't, I'm sure it's not happening up here in Canada, but down in the States, we're living like there is no tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. Like we're never going to have to pay our debts. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we can just print money and borrow money from the Chinese or wherever else. Yeah. All we want because we ain't going to have to pay our debts, right? And you just swipe that plastic all oh, you want to swipe it because you're not going to have to pay for it. And you just do anything else you want to do because you're going to get by with it. No, we're not. That's a stupid way to live. That's a dead end street. That's disaster looking for a place to happen, my daddy would say. And friends, the Holy Spirit won't let you live that way. Right. He's going to get all up in the middle of your life and say, wait just a minute, dear. You're going to have to answer to God. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. You know, the law enforcement people understand the principle that it's good for us to think about a moment. They'll put a patrol car out in the middle of an interstate highway and there'll be a patrolman sitting there reading the newspaper. He's not running radar. He's just sitting there in a marked patrol car and everybody that's the breaking the law slamming on the brakes about causing a rear end collision. You know? <laughs> They've got to go to conscience. I used to travel back and forth to Knoxville, Tennessee. If you've been down to the convention, you have to go right through there where Interstate 75 gets on to, uh, actually the, the bypass, 640 gets on to 40 to go east. And there's a steep start 
curve that goes under the interstate and there's a big concrete embankment there and there'd be a patrolman sitting under that, that and because the speed limit drops right there. I think it, Andrew reminded me to watch, somebody reminded me to watch my speed coming into the, the, the border crossing mm -hmm. and I was thankful they did. <laughs> and one day I was going through there, everybody slam on their brakes because that policeman would be there. One day I was coming through there it was a rollback record back up there, and he was unloading a police car from the back of his record. And sitting under the stairwell of that <coughs> police car was a mannequin. Uh -oh. <laughs> Wasn't even real. But it worked. <laughs> it worked. <laughs> he was in a police uniform, and it worked. It just said to people, he wasn't going to write any tickets. He wasn't running any radar. He evidently didn't even have a motor in his car because they had to bring it in there on a rollback record. Huh? It was probably a blown up police car. But it worked because it reminded the people going yeah. through there of law enforcement and laws and judgment yeah. and judges. And it slowed them down. Folks, the Holy Spirit will be the policeman in your life. Yeah, he will. Yep. Yes, he will. He will remind you that you're going to answer for how you live. And all oh, my friends, that's a beautiful thing. He'll trouble your life. A number of years ago, I heard somebody tell the story of a young girl who, who'd been from a wicked, wicked family and, and had gotten into a church through a Sunday school ministry and gotten saved, beautifully saved, wonderfully saved, and, and was such a blessing and so involved in the ministries of the church. And, and as she got to the age where she was college age, her pastor urged her to go to Bible school, prepare for ministry. So she signed up and went away to Bible school. And she'd been gone for a good number of months. Didn't have money to travel back and forth to her home church. But finally she was able to come home for a weekend in her church. And the girl that had always been radiant and, and joyful in her testimonies and such a bright spot in church came in and sat almost in the back, kind of had her head down. Looked like her, she lost her best friend, and the pastor could hardly wait till the service was over to have a conversation with that girl. And he said to her when he when he went out, "I want to talk to you. Won't you stay? I want to talk to you." And when others had gone out, he walked over and he said, "What is going on? What what's wrong? What's troubling you?" And he said, and she said, "Pastor, I'll tell you what's troubling me." Not until I walked back into my own church did I realize I'm not bothered by things that used to bother me as I used to. The Holy Spirit used to be so faithful to deal with my heart yeah. and yeah. work in my life. Mm -hmm. And I've gotten into an atmosphere where I, I just am not bothered. That's what's bothering me. And I said to the Lord when I heard that story, Lord, don't ever let me get to the place where I'm not bothered, Amen. where I'm not troubled. I want the Holy Spirit to work in my life. Don't you? Yes. Quench not the Spirit's reproof. Right. Let me quickly give you the other two. Quench not the Spirit's revelation. Look at verse 13. When He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide you into all truth. He didn't say He would scare you into all truth. Right. Unfortunately, some of us have our stories about being scared into truth. Yes. He didn't say he would drive you into all truth. He said he will guide you. Anybody here ever had a guide? Whether it's a hunting guide, or a fishing guide, or a tour guide, you had a guide? You've been on any tour trips, you've had a guide. What does a guide do? A guide takes you where you want to go. To experience something you want to experience, but you don't know how to do it best. Huh? Think about the Holy Spirit in the light of what a guide is. The Holy Spirit will only take you where you want to go. Paul talks about people that don't love the truth anymore. Hmm? The Holy Spirit will never take you into truth you don't love. The way to have the Holy Spirit guide you into truth is to love the truth. Amen? And say to the Holy Spirit, Lord, guide me. Don't let me ever be negative when it comes to the truth. Guide me into all truth. I thank God for the faithful guidance of the Holy Spirit. Yes, and you know yes. that the Holy Spirit speaks Canadian. 
Oh, yeah. He says a boat, <laughs> host, and whatever you guys say up here. You and I say, whatever, however you say. Yeah. Yep. And he speaks southern too. Hallelujah. One of the, if, if you want to speak Southern, if the word ends in an A, you always put an R on it. So my grandmother's name was Alma. So she's Alma. <laughs> Alma. <laughs> and, and hallelujah is hallelujah. Yeah. yeah, there you go. That's your Southern language lesson for the night. But the yeah. Holy Spirit speaks that language. <laughs> what did he do on the day of Pentecost? <laughs> he spoke what, 16, 18 different languages? And Peter stood up there and spoke in one language, but between Peter's lips and their ears and their heart, every man heard him in his Praise own God. birth language. Yes. Yes. Isn't that beautiful? Yes. yes. I've seen the Holy Spirit do that. He's doing that tonight. Yes, he is. Communication is a challenge in the very best of circumstances. Anybody that's married knows that. <laughs> No, honey, I've been living with you how many, 40 some years for Kathy and I, and, and, and trying to talk to you, and I think I got it mastered. Uh -uh. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I thought I said that, but I said this, or I didn't say, I need some help, Chris. If you could give me a little session this week. While you're here. Um, yeah, communicate, if you're a parent, you know that, right? I told you, huh? <laughs> but isn't it wonderful that the Holy Spirit takes a message that might be easily misunderstood yeah. and brings it to hearts, right, right, to heart languages? Mm -hmm. And sometimes He says something better than the, the preacher says it. And in, a, in a way, he's talking to some people right here in this service tonight. He's saying things to you that I'm not actually saying. But that's what the Holy Spirit does. I'll never forget a night I was preaching revival. Can you remember now where it was? There was a little tiny church and it was in Ohio, West Virginia somewhere. And, and there was a, an old lady there that night that had a young lady that appeared to be a foreign girl with her. And when I finished preaching, that young girl turned to that old lady and here they came to the altar. And that girl got saved that night. And that old lady was absolutely off the charts rejoicing. And she came straight at me. And she said, Richard, you're not going to believe this, but that's my daughter-in-law. She doesn't speak any English. Wow. But she says she understood every word of your message uh, tonight. Yeah. Yes, sir. And God saved her soul at this altar. I'm telling you, folks, that's what He does. He guides us into truth. He speaks the truth to us if we love the truth. If you quench the Spirit's revelation of truth, you'll become susceptible to error. God shall send them strong delusions. They'll believe a lie. They'll be damned because they love not the truth but have pleasure in unrighteousness. By quenching the Spirit's revelation, you become insensitive to spiritual, eternal things. Notice what he says in verse 13, latter part of the verse. He will show you things to come. That doesn't mean he's going to make you a fortune teller. And you can prophesy things in the future. No, it just sends you things. He's going to put your eyes on spiritual, eternal things and not on things on the earth. You'll be focused on things to come, not on just what's happening right now. One of the problems with our world is we're all about living today as if there's no tomorrow. Yeah. Holy Spirit won't let you do that, folks. He's going to guide you in a way that will enable you to think about tomorrow, whether it's in your, your life, in your family, in your work, or whatever. He's going to guide you with an, with an eye to things to come. Amen? Yeah. Raising your family, whatever it is you do. And oh, how desperately we need the role of the Holy Spirit in revealing to us eternal things, things to come. That will keep our eyes where they ought to be. Our priorities where they ought to be. The third thing he does in revealing to us, look at verse 14. He shall glorify me. For he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you by quenching the spiritual revelation. You will be unchallenged challenged by spiritual riches. 
I am deeply troubled by how few people there are that seem to get excited about spiritual riches. I rejoice in the, the, the word, the, the, the information that Brother Gray shared with us tonight about the growth of IH Convention. I love it that they brought it to Gatlinburg because it's right up the road for me. And it's to be the most beautiful part of the United States. And, and you can come enjoy it with us. If the bears don't get you, yeah. the bears came this year. And uh, it, it's just wonderful how it's expanded and grown. But friends, there are just so many people that even at Gatlinburg are unchallenged by spiritual riches. We need a revival of people that are hungry for spiritual riches, not just how to beat the economy and how to, how to make more money. Unfortunately, there's too many people that are too wrapped up in the, the, the newest get rich scheme. We need to be wrapped up in the eternal riches. Yes. Yes. Amen. He Amen. will he will challenge you deeply to an appreciation. All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore I said he's going to take the mine and show it unto you. And all of those things point to Christ. For that's what he does. The last thing, and I'm pushing hard here to get through, is that when you quench the Spirit, you will quench the Spirit's refuge. Now you don't find this one just laid out for you as beautifully as the other two. But it's here. And I said that last verse is what I want to take you to. The first verse of chapter 16 said, These things have I spoken unto you that you should not be caused to stumble. The last verse says, These things have I spoken unto you that in me you might have peace. Good. But Jesus said there's a way to have peace. That's right. And these things have I spoken unto you that in me you might have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Right. Well, how do you Quench not the spirits. He said in John 14, but the comfort, verse 26, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you, peace. I live with you. My peace I give unto you. Yes. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be Praise God. Folks, I want the Spirit's refuge. I need the Spirit's refuge. I've had to have the Spirit's refuge for recent <laughs> weeks when it, it looked like I was not going to make it. Yeah. But in the midst of all that turmoil yeah. and crises and trouble and bad news and whatever was going on, there was peace, Praise inner peace Praise in my heart. No fear whatsoever. Other refuge have I none. Hangs my helpless soul on the leave me. Not alone still support and comfort me. All my trust on thee is saved. All my help from thee I bring. Cover my defenseless head with the shadow of thy will. So my friend, how do we have that peace? How do we have that refuge? I can tell you. By not quenching the Spirit's reproof. You can't have the refuge if you quench the Spirit's reproof. Of sin, of righteousness, of judgment. You can't have the Spirit's refuge if you have quenched the Spirit's revelation or guidance in the truth. You've got to have it. And when you have not quenched the Spirit's work in your life, if you have embraced his guidance in the truth, his reproof of sin and of righteousness and his judgment, when the troubles come, you'll have a refuge. You'll have peace. Only then can you experience the Spirit's peace. Thank God for the peace that comes in Christ in that time of refuge. If you're providing that environment in your heart that enables the Spirit to function, are you thinking about that tonight? What am I doing that may be somehow robbing the Holy Spirit of the conditions necessary for Him to function in my life? And if you're allowing Him, oh my friends, you will find whatever comes your way, whatever bad news. Jesus said, fellas, I'm going to have to be honest with you. Bad news. They're going to try to kill you. They're going to put you out of the synagogue. They're going to they're believe that Somebody that kills you is doing God's service. Mm -hmm. 
Of course they did. But he said, I've overcome the world. Amen. You can have peace in me. I was missions director for the Bible Methodist Connection Churches. And that job didn't pay enough to pay the bills. So I was doing revival meetings, traveling internationally, uh, just a lot of long overseas trips. And then I'd get home and take off immediately and go preach a revival somewhere. They'd just wear you out. They'd just wear you down. And I was somewhere in Pennsylvania. Paul, this story's hard for me to tell. I finished a revival on a Sunday night, and I was going right straight to another one. I wasn't going to get to go home. You know that too. Kathy was not able to travel with me. I was in an old 98 Oldsmobile, riding down the road, Interstate 81, as I remember it. And the phone rang. It was my wife. And she was giving me some very heartbreaking news about one of my adult children and decisions they were making. Very heartbreaking. I felt like my world completely crashed in that car. I quickly got off the phone, I couldn't talk. And I bawled and I cried. And I pounded the steering wheel. The tears blinded my eyes as I drove. And I said, God, you've got to give me healing for my crushed, hurting heart. I've got to have healing for this heart. I can't go minister to, to other people when I am in such pain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The faithful Holy Spirit slipped in the, the front seat of that old 98 old book. And this is what he said. He said, you're not hurting, you're angry. I said, wait just a minute. Wait just a minute. The tears were blind. I, I, I'm hurting. I'm hurting. No, the Spirit said. It's hard to argue with the Holy Spirit. The Spirit said, no, you're angry. You know that your image is being tarnished and damaged. And your reputation is getting hurt by what's going on. And you're mad about it. You're not happy about it. And I said, but oh God, this is not about me. This is about my child. This is, a, Lord, this is not about me. And the Holy Spirit said, no, it shouldn't be. And I said, Lord, Take it out of my heart. I want no part of it. I want no part of it. It's not about my image. And you know what happened? All of a sudden, it was gone. And the sweetest peace flooded into my heart. And with it came complete healing into my heart. And I rode down the road. And it suddenly dawned on me that I was very close to Levin, uh, Lancaster, Lancaster. And I thought, I've got some time to kill here. I'm going to pull in here at Sight and Sound and see what's going on. And it was the story of Abraham. And in a few moments, I was sitting in that smaller menu there, watching the story of Abraham, and God ministered to me in a way more powerful than I think he ever has in a camp meeting in that drama about the life of Abraham simply because I'd been willing to admit the Spirit to prove. I'd been willing to let him guide me in the truth. And I was experiencing the Spirit to Now folks, that's holiness. That's what it's about. The Holy Spirit's role in your life. And we've desperately got to have it. We've desperately got to get yeah. Let's stay together. I see it's always a place where people are more than welcome to seek God. Yeah. I'm not going to put on a pull. I'm not going to have the singer sing or try to use any emotional pull whatsoever tonight. 
my encouragement to you, friends, my encouragement to you, uh, you're welcome to come pray, but my encouragement would be find a quiet place <laughs> and get along with God <laughs> and say, Lord, is there something you want to say to me in the message that we received tonight? Lord, am I hearing your reproof? Am I letting you reveal to me what you choose and desire to reveal to me, Lord? I need your refuge. Yeah. And if you'll be honest with God, I promise you, friends, God will meet with you. Yes, he will. And God's going to help us this way. Let's pray together. Father, you see every heart, you know every need. You know those areas, Father, that your faithful spirit has spoken even during this service tonight. So we pray, Lord, that you would help us to have open and receptive hearts and obedient hearts to the faithful Holy Spirit so that you can work in us and do for us what you choose to do. And we as your people can bring honor and glory to your name, be the people filled with your spirit that you can use. Have your way in the continuance of this convention, help in the tomorrow afternoon service and then tomorrow evening. May the Spirit of God continue to work among us for your honor and glory, we pray in Jesus' name. God bless you.